Wow. <laughs> so, hello, my name's Aggie Haynes, and like most of you, um, I live inside a body. And this is quite a fascinating thing for a designer who's interested in um, visuals. <laughs> Sorry, I think I don't know how to work the thing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> He's interested in visuals as well as mechanisms. So these weird and wonderful things that exist inside us have offered endless inspiration throughout design history as well as my own work. So how might the, our sort of inherent morbid curiosity for the viscera of life affect the future of design, not only for our environment, but for us as sentient sacks of flesh within it? So, you know, when we think about the future of the human body, we often think of things from science fiction and films, but in fact, there's some sort of seemingly fantastical scientific research happening right now, in particularly in terms of biological replication and production. And I'm not just interested in sort of stem cell research, but also the future of synthetic biology and bioprinting. Mostly of the work of Anthony Atala, who works at the Wake Forest University, as you can see him here in 2011. And in his hands, he's holding a sort of a peachy oval, which could be the future design for a kidney. And this kidney has been essentially printed um, layer upon layer to form a 3D structure by using cells from our own body rather than ink. And it's really amazing to think, you know, you could print things like skin or windpipes or, or bladders or even more complex structures like hearts um, just with the click of a computer mouse. So, uh, w with this regrowth and replication, we might start to sort of be able to acquire, acquire new design materials. And if we start to manipulate our body, perhaps we could start thinking of ourselves as a system of interchangeable parts. In this modern view of our sort of digitalized, airbrushed, preserved, regimented, and perfect body, what would stop us searching for better parts than we have now? So I started to think, what, what might the desired characteristics be? And how might these take shape? So are two heads better than one? And yeah, I like to think of Frankenstein as a sort of interesting paradigm for some of the sort of ethics and issues I'm discussing here. The, and uh, Mary Shelley writes, frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. And if you think about it, the monster's awakening is supremely frightful. The fact that they sort of bring something to life through the means of science should give us the thrill of human achievement, but in fact, it actually leaves us with the ominous danger signs of contravening the natural order. So the idea of um, you know, future body parts seems really distant, but we're actually already living enhanced lives. If you think about how in the past we've um, you know, furthered our life through changing our performance or appearance, you can see that there are actually enhancements all around us. And some of them are so familiar that we hardly even see them as enhancements at all. For example, dental braces or reading glasses or walking sticks which are quite different to some of the ones that you see in certain films, um, like the machine gun leg in um, Planet Terror. But essentially, all these things are there to, to further our function. And actually, these sort of mechanical cyborgs don't just exist in films. So this is Neil Havison, and he was born colorblind. And you can see this protrusion coming out the front of his head, and essentially what that does is um, acts as a third eye. It recognizes color and translates it into frequencies. So he's got this really amazing relationship with color that none of us have. Um, after learning all the names of the colors and the sounds that, that go with them, this sort of became perception in his mind. And it's, he, he, he really interestingly talks about how different people's faces sound different. And what I found interesting is that he says that Prince Charles actually has one of the nicest sounding faces, which I found really odd. <laughs> Also, this is Rob Spence. Um, he had to have his eye removed and decided to instead have a camera put in there, which he's now filmed a few documentaries on. As well as Jerry Javala, who had his um, finger amputated, and in, instead of just having a normal prosthetic, he decided to have a two gigabyte USB drive fitted in. <laughs> But it's, it's really amazing to think that these sort of designs have actually come about due to disability. 
And I'm sure a lot of you know Amy Mullins, but she's an amazing example of this. She was, she was born with fibula hemimelia, so she had to have both of her lower legs amputated. But this didn't affect her career. She's, she's probably most famous for being the first person to wear the carbon fiber running legs. And these brought up amazing questions about um, the future of prosthetics and the future of, you know, advancement. And what was interesting is, I'm really fascinating about these sort of prosthetics, is they're not just trying to replicate human function, but they're actually trying to add something else, perhaps something even superhuman. So, <laughs> Coming from a family of artists, I'm sort of quite used to there being extra limbs um, <laughs> lying around my house. This is a picture of my dad in his studio in Deptford, London. And both of my parents used to come home with, with body parts in all forms and sort of leave them on top of the refrigerator. <laughs> so growing up in this sort of circumstances made me look at materials in quite a different way. And if you think about the body, we're really made of amazingly practicable substances, and bone is really an obsession of mine. I, f I find it amazing that it's so strong, but it's also flexible, and it can actually grow up to one millimeter a day when farmed in a particular direction, using, using these sort of frames. So as a designer and a sort of self-conscious human being, the first thing I thought of was, um, what could I do with my face? So how might I be able to move my face around and how might this benefit me? And this project sort of started around the time of the Olympics in London, so I thought it might be interesting to try and make myself more aerodynamic. What sort of surgical procedure might I need to do this and, and would the sort of the desire to change override the surgical procedure? So I created a series of facial prosthetics, um, sort of imagining what I might look like post-surgery. And this was sort of an interesting learning curve for me, um, and involved me sticking a lot of horrible stuff to my face, which sort of uh, almost felt like my skin had gone through an odd procedure in itself. But it was amazing to see how these shapes sort of might develop and really experience what it might be like to look like this. And then I sort of started thinking of other things. So could you have really long hands for reaching stuff? Or could you have whiskers for sensing? Or big nostrils so that you could smell things? Um, and to be honest, I was just getting a bit carried away. <laughs> but <laughs> so it was, sort of, it was quite interesting to think about what was actually surgically possible. And I talked to a lot of um, medical students and surgeons about this. And then I went back to my research and started discovering something quite unusual. These modifications actually seem to be things that people do to their children. Um, and, and then from a material perspective, I was like, oh yeah, that, that really makes sense. Because when you're a baby, you're, you're most malleable, so your bones are, are most maneuverable. And from a parent's point of view, you want what's best for your child. So if it's more socially acceptable to have a certain shaped head, you'd want your child to be comfortable within the boundaries of social norms. But actually, when it was more popular at one stage to have a pointed shaped head, believe it or not, it's popular now to have a round shaped head. And we still have devices today to keep our babies' heads even and round. So whether it's to do with health, or beauty, or job prospects, and therefore social mobility. Parents worldwide are trying to somehow further their child's survival. So I decided to design a series of babies, um, all with modifications implemented by the parent to benefit the child later in life. So this was the first baby, and it was the aerodynamic one. With a more ridged nose, hopefully it would gain more job prospects in the field of sport. This one, which I have with me today, um, this one, as you can see, has a higher head surface area to dissipate heat. So the idea is that it might be able to live more comfortably in the wake of global warming. <laughs> this baby, which has massive cheeks, could essentially um, absorb more caffeine and work for longer hours and therefore earn more money. <laughs> And then I thought of more health issues. So perhaps as, as pollution increases, so does the incidence of asthma. So perhaps removing a toe might increase this baby's chances of getting something like hookworm, which is a parasite that can actually diminish allergies. Or this one, which people find perhaps the most visually disturbing, um, is, is um, 
might benefit from having a new orifice in a low fatty area. So if it suffered from something like diabetes, it might be able to absorb drugs um, slower over a longer period of time. I'll just put this down. So after doing this project, I started sort of realizing the opposing sentiments that were thematic in Frankenstein. On one hand, we've got this desire for advancement and enhancement, and then on the other hand, we've sort of got the risks involved in trying to achieve this. So if we sort of think about how we try to modify ourselves in the past, we can realize that modification is actually a sort of ancient and deep-seated aspiration. If we look at the Greek tale of Icarus, you know, overzealously using technology um, with extreme risk, we start to realize that these, these sort of modifications are quite, sort of, are quite risky, and perhaps they might actually alter what it fundamentally means to be human. And by modifying ourselves already, there are a lot of uh, devices that exist um, to do so. And some of them are actually quite disturbingly invasive, all in the name of physical enhancement. So I started to find it quite fascinating that we actually might be forming a bit of a blind spot to brutality in the aim to dissem disseminate research, in which these sort of enhancement tools actually start to bear more resemblances to things like horror films. So what might this mean for our actual evolution? We still can't see, hear, smell, or taste half as well as all these amazing creatures around us. So would it actually be beneficial to have the skin of a rhinoceros or the circulatory system of a penguin or you know, the lungs of a porpoise? And it's quite odd because when I show people the babies, they often find it quite disturbing that we might modify people, but we've been doing it to animals for, for hundreds of years. This sort of Arnold Schwarzenegger of a cow um, <laughs> is, is called the Belgian Blue. And it's been modified before birth in its sperm to have a mutation in which it creates an extremely high muscle mass. And the reason for this cow is just purely to create leaner meat with a lower fat content. But we also know that there's, food isn't the only reason why we modify animals. If you know about crufts, you'll know that the, the huge variation in dogs from the Great Dane to the Chihuahua has actually mainly come from human intervention. That, so this, <laughs> this weird desire to have you know, smaller pooches with bigger eyes and flatter backs, fluffier tails, and the weird one is more skin, <laughs> um, has actually led to a health issue in dogs. And I know this is a bit of a juxtaposition, but um, <laughs> after watching this very cutesy animal, that Syringa myelia is actually one of the most disturbing, in which, uh, <laughs> in which sort of um, fluid-filled cavities develop in the brain. And this is just as a result of, of trying to produce larger eyes. So you'd think that the knowledge produced by these injustices should give us a bit of a warning of what it might be like when we start to modify ourselves. And this kitten as well, for example, as you can see, it's glowing, and this is real. It's been modified um, with genes from a jellyfish. And it, it glows under certain light. I couldn't believe it when I first saw it. Um, and it's really amazing because we don't see this as disturbing as modifying humans because animals are already almost seen as products. So if we were to, from a design perspective, if we were to modify animals, it seems almost like the logical next step to produce a kitten that could essentially double up as a nightlight. So I decided to think of myself as Frankenstein, and I took different pieces, put them together, and thought about other functions that may be helpful that could come out of this. I thought about the body as like a mechanical system with um, issues as sort of malfunctions that could be technically rectified. So if you could essentially um, create hybrid organs, <laughs> like, like this one. I don't know whether it's going to come on. Oh, no. Essentially, if you could create hybrid organs, um, you might, out of things like parts from us and parts from animals, you could create totally new functions that evolution would take millions of years to create. So I decided to create a series of um, three speculative organs, each designed for a small demographic of people prone to a specific disorder. So this one is essentially like a mechanical defibrillator, or, um, but it's biological. The idea is that it's got a suction pad that would attach to the heart and a row of cilia cells like that in the human ear that recognize unusual movement. It then would 
cause a muscular wall to contract, discharging a row of electrocyte cells, similar to that in almost like um, an electric eel. And actually, an electric eel can form a high enough voltage to shock the heart back to its normal beating pattern. The next organ is, is for people who might be prone to having a stroke. It's got a, cell, uh, a pouch of osmiotic cells, and the idea is that this can recognize liquid pressure. And it's also got a salivary gland from a leech um, that can release an anticoagulant called hiridin. And the idea is that when the pressure in your brain gets too high, hiridin could be released, released which can lessen um, your chance of having a blood clot. And finally, this organ, which is for people who suffer from cystic fibrosis. So the idea is that it's made from um, the muscular wall of a rattlesnake and can vibrate over a long period of time using little energy to dislodge mucus, which can then travel down these tubes and into the stomach out through the digestive system. So it seems that uh, over millions of years, organisms have been nicely designed or fitted by the blind force of natural selection. Perhaps now we're just taking control of our own evolution by sort of extending our idea of the human body. So by modifying the way that we live in our environment, we've already created a new future. <laughs> Perhaps the next phase of evolution is just directed evolution or design, in which we're physically altering the physiological forms that inhabit our planet. But are we prepared to manipulate the plasms of life um, with unprecedented power? Are we, like Frankenstein, ready to accept the strained relationship between creator and created? Thank you.